Hi, and welcome to our city. In the next few weeks, we'll be meeting Montrealers who'll be contributing their talents and services to make our city one to be proud of. Our city is an educational project researched and produced by students of Concordia University in conjunction with CFCF Television. Each show will deal with a specific theme relating to our city. This week, we'll take a look at Montreal, past and present. And I'll be back with our first guest right after this. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a tourist in Montreal? After listening to our first guest, you may well want to be. Pierre Labrie is the Commissioner of Tourism in the city of Montreal. Hi, welcome yeah, to the yeah. show. Now, I've been told that CDEM is a new department created by the city of Montreal. Can you tell me what CDEM stands for and what it's supposed to do? Yes, CDEM means in English the Montreal Economic Development Incentive Commission, the, or the acronym MEDIC. In French, it's uh, Commission d'Initiative et de Développement Économique de Montréal. It's a new uh, municipal service which aim uh, at the economic development of our city, uh, overlooking tourism, transport, commerce, industry, and cinema. Now, I know that CDEM has created a, a promotional campaign for Montreal called Montreal the Paradoxical. And I find that really fascinating because the whole idea of it is to sell a city. You know, how do you go about you know, with a marketing plan to sell a whole entire city? It's quite a challenge. Uh, we have to uh, look at, uh, well, if you see on the, on, the, on the back screen now, you have the, uh, the brochure we have print uh, this fall for the campaign. Uh, our goal was to uh, have a new marketing tool to promote Montreal in winter time. It's the slow uh, tourism season. Our hotel need more visitors to our city. And we decide, in conjunction with 20 hotel properties in Montreal, to uh, create that concept, Montreal, the paradoxical. But I'm sure your, your next question will be, why paradoxical as, a, as such? It's because Montreal, in wintertime, is a city of contrast. It's a city uh, where you have different worlds next doors. You have the underground city, you have the Mont Royal, the Ile Notre Dame, and all the city itself is accessible by metro. So using the, the word paradoxical for us was to promote the contrast of Montreal, the uh, new experience to a city adventure for visitors coming to Montreal. Uh, it's quite a challenge because we have to promote Montreal in winter time at a time of the year which is quite cold and uh, we are living it this year especially. And we had to, to, uh, to use all the marketing uh, tools or uh, new concepts uh, which need to be uh, put together for that campaign. And aside from the 20 hotels, who else is participating in this project? In this project, uh, the partners are the city uh, and the 20 hotels. However, uh, above that or next to it, the Quebec government and the Canadian government office of tourism and some major uh, carriers, mostly airlines, uh, tied up to our ca campaign and uh, initiate some programs in conjunction with our own basic program. 
by example, we print a lot of literature uh, to promote Montreal in wintertime. Some of these companies or entities decide to use our literature and our graphic or visual concepts to do their own promotion. And in conjunction with that, it meant that the original uh, 250000 which was invested by the city and the hoteliers, has now turned around in a $400,000 advertising program because of the tied-up of some private sector's uh, companies who were interested in promoting Montreal in wintertime also. And you say that each hotel then is responsible for its own marketing package then. Do you have any examples of what certain hotels are offering? Yes. Uh, to give you only a couple of examples, one hotel is, uh, which is linked to the metro system is offering uh, tickets to any special events or um, sports show going on in town right now. Plus, uh, in, on above this, these tickets, there are meals, uh, breakfast, and transportation services included in the price of the package, which uh, run for $72 per person, all-inclusive. Uh, this is a type of package. Another hotel, which is uh, more uh, closer to the Laurentian, is offering uh, ski tickets and car rental in conjunction with uh, the hotel rooms available for two nights. And this runs, I think, for $69 per person. And as a tourist attraction, how does Montreal compare to other cities in North America? Montreal is certainly one of the best known cities in North America. It's the only city in the world, I would say, which hosts three international events, the Expo 67, the Olympics, the Florelis, and we have a, a score of other international events, which um, I would say help uh, to identify Montreal as an international uh, destination. However, compared to other major cities in Canada, Montreal is certainly the leader in terms of international promotion. However, Toronto also is going very strong, and it, it's also well promoted by the Ontario government. And uh, now that you see a pattern that other destinations in Canada are also improving their, uh, the numbers of tourism uh, who are coming, going there. But so far, Montreal is still one of the, the best destinations in Canada in terms of uh, uh, city experience. I know that one of the first things Montrealers tend to do, I mean tourists in Montreal tend to do when they come to the city, is take a ride in the Kalesh. And I've heard that there's been some sort of crackdown on Kalesh drivers, that there's some sort of courses that they have to take before they're allowed to drive these Kaleshes. Yeah. Is that right? Can you elaborate on that? It's true. Uh, the word crackdown is maybe a bit uh, strong, but uh, for we, were, we are very conscious that one of... Uh, the most important uh, person um, toward the, the relationship between the visitors and the visitee uh, are the escort guides, you know, the calèche drivers, the cab drivers, the sightseeing tour guides. And last year, uh, we found that it was time to revamp our um, training program for calèche uh, drivers. So we initiate a program in conjunction with our uh, tourism department to train all college drivers and offer them at least a basic information package on the network of roads and uh, areas in the city they are authorized to tour with their uh, college. So this start uh, last spring, it was quite successful. We had close to 100 uh, um, drivers attending and we plan to repeat the experience this spring. And be honest with you, I think we will also improve the standards by, by being a bit more uh, severe on uh, our exams, if you want. I know uh, another thing that makes Montreal so unusual is this vast underground system. I know it really comes in handy during the uh, winter months. Is that something that you see the city expanding in? Very much, uh, both in terms of, uh, I would say, urban development, but this is not my uh, area of concern, but in terms of tourism promo uh, promotion, uh, the underground city of Montreal is unique in the world. Uh, it is almost uh, 15 kilometers long. There is a, it is accessible by metro. You can live underground without going outside. And uh, in wintertime especially, the underground city is a must. It's uh, the core on which we, we can rely to promote Montreal as a city experience or s vacation experience in wintertime. Why is it then that it's just Montreal that has this vast underground? Why wouldn't a city like Quebec City have one? 
Well, it all depends on the pattern of the urban development. Quebec City is, a, is an old uh, historical district under which you cannot, I would say, uh, build too, much, too many underground links without creating uh, uh, problems. But it's just too well spread. You can have an underground city as far as you have a concentration of population oh, and Montreal services. Has the downtown core. We have a downtown core which uh, offer good opportunities for both on-ground and underground developments. And this Montreal the paradoxical campaign, who is it aimed to? Is it basically the people in the States and in Ontario? Uh, I would say for everybody, uh, but first we were targeting the American market, the East Coast, I would say from the New England States down to Washington DC and the Ontario market. Uh, these were our two prime area of concerns where we spent close to $250,000 in advertising. And because in this area you have close to 80 million um, uh, of population, and these people are maybe the, mo the, the most wealthy in North America, and they travel more than once a year. So our target is an area which is less than 700 miles from Montreal. However, based on uh, recent uh, polling, uh, it was request to us that we expand our promotion to the province of Quebec because there's also a potential uh, market for Montreal in attracting Quebecers who need a short-term short vacation in Montreal in wintertime. And uh, this morning, uh, by the way, I was talking with someone who said that the concept of Montreal the paradoxical could be well adapted as a gateway package for Europeans coming to Montreal in summertime. So um, I think that this year we had to concentrate on two markets, but in the future it will be expanded to other areas of interest also. So there's no fear among the Americans about, uh, you hear rumors about language police that are patrolling the streets of Montreal. I heard this from a friend of mine in Toronto. Uh, I don't know who is starting these r rumors, but it, uh, these are killer and uh, it means absolutely nothing. Montreal, there is no language problem for the visitors, is uh, most welcome. As far as we as Montrealers want to welcome our visitors, for sure. But I think that we are, uh, Quebecers in general, uh, hospitable. And it's uh, our responsibility to be hospitable to our visitors. And I guess the campaign is a good one for Montrealers, too. They could just take advantage of the packages. Yes, that's uh, something uh, someone mentioned to me last yeah. week, that uh, we should... Uh, as Montrealers, take more time to visit Montreal as tourists. Well, thank so. you very much for being on our show. We've just run out of time. Pleasure. I'll be back right after this.
Montrealers can look forward to an exciting future. But how many of us really know about Montreal's past? What was it really like? With me now is Professor Ronald Rudin. He's a history professor at Concordia University, and he's currently doing research on the Quebec economy. He's also one of the directors for the Center of the Study of Anglophone Quebec. Hi, and welcome to the show. Thank you. I know that people are naturally curious. I know that I've always wondered what the area that I used to live in was like way before I have ever seen it. And I know that uh, when you teach history in your classes, you show slides to your students about what Montreal used to be like, some scenery from there. Maybe you could tell me something about it. Well, I think it's important for people to have a sense of how the city used to look. Uh, this is the Van, Tor Van Horn Mansion as it stood before 1973 at the corner of Sherbrooke and Stanley. It was uh, impressive both on the inside and the outside. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, 1973, it uh, was demolished. And now what's left is uh, a building which architecturally is somewhat less uh, desirable, I think, than the one that we had before. Just the one shown there. And what's the significance of the Van Horn Mansion? Well, I think to, to a lot of people it had a, a couple of uh, significant aspects. Uh, one was the fact that Van Horn himself had been uh, an important figure in the economic uh, growth of Montreal to prominence. He was one of the people responsible for the building of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, so I think to, to remember a person who had contributed something to, to Montreal's growth was one aspect, and the other was that architecturally it was of some significance, uh, both in terms of its external and internal aspects. Then why was it allowed to, you know, why was that thing allowed to happen, and why wasn't it preserved? Well, it, it hasn't always been a general policy on the part of the various levels of, uh, of government. Uh, to see the preservation of these buildings as uh, vital. And also for the people who, who own the buildings, it's difficult uh, economically to maintain buildings which uh, bring in relatively little in the way of rent on property which is of uh, considerable value. So it value. comes down to economics. Uh, to a certain degree, and, and the willingness of government to act. And what about Alcan? Isn't uh, Alcan involved in preserving? Well, I think the, the other side of what's happened on Sherbrooke, on the one hand, is the, the destruction of the Van Horn Mansion. The other side of this is uh, Alcan's decision to uh, preserve a number of buildings on, uh, on Sherbrooke to uh, form their corporate headquarters. And I think it's an example of the way in which old buildings can be uh, renovated and, and used uh, to serve modern functions. I know that there's more to Montreal's history than just old buildings. I know that you have a story about... Um well, religion in the past, and about a man who was denied his last rights. Well, I think the other side of someone like who, like Van Horn, who was a businessman, is uh, is the role that religion played in 19th century Montreal. And there's the uh, the uh, the story about a man by the name of Joseph Guibord. Uh, Guibord uh, belonged to an organization that uh, believed in keeping a library that contained a number of books that the Catholic Church didn't approve of. And the Bishop of Montreal at the time informed all the members of this organization that if they didn't get rid of certain books in their shelves, that uh, any member of the organization uh, would be denied last rites upon dying. And poor Gibor died in 1869, uh, was denied his last rites, was put into the Protestant cemetery, but a lawsuit was uh, begun uh, by some friends of his shortly thereafter. And in, in 1874, it was finally uh, decided after a number of cases and appeals that uh, Guy Bourg, in fact, had a right to be buried in the Catholic cemetery in Cotonèche. Uh, unfortunately, the bishop still didn't agree. And when Guy Bourg, uh, was brought out of his uh, resting place of five years in uh, 1875, uh, the bishop encouraged people to come out to block the entrance to the cemetery to deny him the ability to be buried. He was then put again back in his temporary resting place, moved once again, <laughs> the police accompany him, the troops are called out, and finally in November of 1875, six years after he dies, he finally gets his permanent resting place. And some people have said that Gibor put on more miles when he was dead <laughs> than, than some have while they're living. I'm really intrigued. Um, what sort of books was it that he had that the Catholic Church wouldn't approve of? Well, there were many well into the 20th century that, uh, that, that people couldn't read. Uh, things that we, as tame as Voltaire, uh, well, that we consider tame today, were considered as inappropriate because they encouraged people to think freely and th things of that sort. But this was the kind of role that the Catholic Church certainly played in Montreal in the 19th century. I know that uh, in the past few months, the Sulpician estate has been getting into a lot of newspapers. Can you give me some background on that? Well, again, it's a, an example of the way in which religion played an important role in Montreal's past. In Montreal, in its original establishment, wasn't called Montreal at all. It was called Ville-Marie. It was a religious settlement. And the Sulpicians uh, come only a few years after the original establishment of Montreal, are the landlords, essentially, of the island of Montreal from the 1660s up to uh, the 1850s. 
and uh, throughout that period of time uh, own really most of the land on the island uh, and provide a considerable, considerable amount in the way of uh, education and uh, other sorts of facilities to people. Uh, and one piece of land that they kept for their own was at the foot of the mountain, uh, the area still of the uh, Grand Seminaire, uh, near the corner of Sherbrooke and Atwater. And surrounding it, there were uh, uh, spectacular woods and gardens that they had kept up, uh, and that I think some people felt uh, up to the present uh, should have been preserved as a, a sense of to give us a sense of our history oh, and strong also... Strong enough to chain themselves to the trees there. Well, there's, the, there's, there's the one story of a person who felt strongly about this who lived across the street that when uh, he heard the buzz saws going out after the woods uh, several months ago, uh, wrapped himself around the tree. Didn't exactly chain himself, but wrapped yeah. himself around it. But I think, again, like the Van Horn story, it's an example of uh, people wanting to preserve a sense of our past, but also uh, provide a, a varied sort of landscape in the city so that it shouldn't only be uh, large high-rise towers because this is what's going to replace the woods or a number of condominium towers uh, but rather a, a varied sort of landscape. What do you see happening to the Salpician estate? Well, the, it, it's clear uh, since nothing else is to be done that uh, the woods uh, have already been largely destroyed and uh, construction is presumably going to go ahead uh, for the building of these condominium towers and it'll be the beginning of the dismantling of the of the estate I think a loss are there any other areas in Montreal like the Salpician estate that are still in existence but maybe the existence is being threatened well it's difficult to say uh, in there's certainly a number of historic buildings still in existence that, that uh, the Wreckers Ball hasn't gotten yet uh, what's difficult though and we learned this from the Salpician question is that we don't find out what's in danger until the last moment and one of the things that citizens groups complained about in the case of the Sulpician lands was they didn't know that the woods were in danger until the last moment and then it was so difficult to act so in a sense that's the basic problem is that there isn't a a policy of uh, people being informed in advance of what may be in danger so that appropriate attempts to try to save them short of hanging onto trees can be formulated I'm gonna ask you to use your imagination now if you could go through time what period of Montreal would you most like to live in? Well, I, I think people like uh, people like Van Horn hold a certain fascination for me. I'm I'm interested in studying uh, the wheelings and dealings, so to speak, of Montreal's businessmen in the late 19th century. It was one of the major business centers, not only for for Canada but for all of North America. Uh, people running banks and industries and uh, all sorts of activities. And I think it would have been interesting to. Uh, be able to uh, have sat uh, in uh, the boardrooms of St. James Street and to see exactly what went on. Being an historian is aggravating. Most of the records have been destroyed. Uh, it would have been interesting to have been there and sort of watched what went on. But when you think back on history, though, you remember people like Van Horn, who was obviously a very affluent man. But what was it like for the poor families back then? Well, I think this is the other side. And if I had to go back to live in the late uh, 19th century, You'd make sure you were rich. I would make sure that I was rich because if you were poor, you had a very uh, poor chance of, of living to begin with. Montreal had the uh, second highest rate of infant mortality in the world, second only to Calcutta. It had the highest rate of tuberculosis in North America. Uh, living conditions were horrendous. People were jammed into uh, really quite awful housing. And, and I think what's striking in Montreal in the late 19th century is the, the incredible distinction between people like Van Horn, who lived quite, uh, quite comfortably. Uh, it was said that uh, in the area to the north of uh, McGill University that uh, this was called the Golden Square Mile, and roughly 70% of the wealth of Canada was concentrated. And then on the other hand, there were the people who lived in the working class districts who had a struggle to literally survive. Uh, so one would want to be careful about where one was born. And in comparison to other cities, is Montreal a very easy place to study historically? Do we have a lot of records and books? Um, yeah, I think I think uh, reasonably so. Uh, the influence of the Catholic Church certainly uh, makes it easy to study certain aspects of Montreal's past because the Catholic Church was always careful to keep very uh, very good records. And also in terms of uh, records that the city has preserved or the businesses have preserved, I think it's a, it's a great place for an historian to work. Do you think that it's, it's a worthwhile project for everybody to go. Do you really think that people have a lack of history in Montreal? Well, I think people have a lack of historical knowledge. I'm, I'm, I'm struck when I teach the course that I do on the history of Montreal of how little people really are familiar with things that they see around them all the time. I often take students of mine through old Montreal 
uh, to try to relate to them things that we've talked about in the course to, to buildings and places that they can see. And I'm, I'm shocked to often to see people who lived in Montreal for maybe 35 or 40 years and, and have never seen the inside of Notre Dame Church or have never walked along St. Paul Street and, and, and who hopefully after they've taken a course and been sensitized to the issues um, have more of a sense. But I think it's something that people have to acquire. And I suspect until people acquire it, uh, things like the destruction of the Van Horn Mansion become possible because until you're sensitized, you don't uh, worry about these issues. I have one last question for you. With the cold temperatures that have been going on this winter, whatever possessed settlers to stay in well, Montreal? You know, well, I, I mean, minus 40 degrees without central heating uh, is beyond me. Well, as I walk from my office to my class to teach, uh, teach a history of Montreal this term, I, I wonder the same thing. But, but I think <laughs> but they made it just the same. Well, I think people live any place where there are jobs, and for a variety of reasons, there were, there were there always were jobs. jobs here, so people were willing to put up with it. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Well, I'll you. be back in a moment. Well, that was our show for today. A brief look at Montreal as a tourist attraction and some interesting facts about Montreal's past. Keep watching Our City for information about Montreal's movie industry, sports scene, customized services, and much, much more. We hope you enjoyed our first show. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now.